Hi, everybody. Welcome in. We're um, getting started right now. Um, as you know, we're talking about asset spending again today and trying to connect our investments with outcomes. That's our big topic of the day. And um, I'm going to kick it over to Jill to um, to give a little warm up and then we're going to get going. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Lammert, the co-director of the National Comprehensive Center, or as we call it, the National Center. The National Center is one of 20 federally funded comprehensive centers that work with state, district, and local leaders, the U.S. Department of Education, national organizations, and community partners to address pressing educational needs around the country. I'm excited that you've joined us today for the second webinar in the series that our partners at Edgenomics are delivering related to the American Rescue Plan funds to support using the funds to support improvement, innovation, and impact in education. Today, Marguerite and the team are going to introduce a tool that can help states and districts think deliberately about how the investments they're making connect to improved outcomes. In case you missed it, you can find the recording of the first webinar in the series, What Can ESSER Spending Data Tell Us, on our website at compcenternetwork.org. I'm going to put the link to the recording in the chat in a moment. Can we go to the next slide, please? You might know that the National Center is currently offering three communities of practice for state teams to develop plans to address pressing educational needs in their states. You can see a description of the communities on the slide, although I know it's pretty small, and you can find more information on our website. And again, I'll put the link in the chat. We want to welcome all of the community members who are here today, as well as other education stakeholders, and we hope that this webinar will prove informative and give you ideas for how to make better use of the ARP funds. With that, I'll turn it over to Marguerite. All right. So as always at Genomics Lab, we kind of really like the poll. So we're going to start with the poll. It's been a year. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take stock so far. How would you rate ESSER's impact on students nationally? So we have, it's been a year since ESSER 3 was approved. It was March. Um, so nationally, not just your district. So we'll just take stock of it. Would you say it's strong? There's some room for improvement, but it's generally going really well or mixed. There's some pivoting is needed to ensure dollars add more value for students. Or would you characterize it as weak? Much of the spending is having little effect. Um, so let me ask you that. Um, does everybody see the poll? I'm not seeing some of the responses. I can see it, Marguerite. Okay. This is Laura. Okay. Um, I can tell you right now, there's a lot in the mixed category here. Okay, so last, but don't, don't give away. I'm any. not gonna give it away. All right, so last chance. So by the way, we have a lot of polls built in and we're we are gonna go quickly through the polls. So you gotta be quick draw with your finger right there, like on the, on the mouse, ready to click one of your answers today, or you're gonna miss out. Um, it's just a, a fun way to keep people engaged. All right, let's go ahead and put up the answers on that one. So in this group, about 80% of you said mixed. A few said strong and 9% uh, of you were worried it's weak. And I'll tell you the actual database answer. And that is, there is simply no way to know. Um, and I know you were giving, I asked you to, this is a bit of a trick question, but we actually don't have any data nationally on how well it's going, on how the effect of these investments has been for student. None, zip, nada, zilch, there is simply no way to know. And so part of that is an intro to say, in the absence of any kind of large scale pulse taking, even any statewide pulse taking, um, in state, the states and the districts are gonna have to figure this out on their own. Um, they're gonna have to say, well, what is happening in my district? Are my students improving? What data do we have on the effect of our investments on our students? Um, so, and this, this should be, something that kind of shakes us a little bit, right? Like we can't wait for somebody on the outside to say, yeah, it's going well, you guys are doing pretty well, or, oh, now's the time to make a shift. It looks like some of these investments are not working. That will be up to individual districts to figure that out, use their own data. It'll be up to states to help districts or even to launch some opportunities where there are measurement involved so that individual districts and schools can, can opt in and take stock of how this is going for students. Because otherwise, there is 
no national answer to this question right now. So um, anyway, that's just a bit of a setup for today. We're gonna to be trying to connect investments to outcomes. I'm gonna lead off with three big strategies and then we're, we're gonna provide a, a tool that we think could be helpful for that. The first is to articulate some measurable goals for ESSER. See how I use the word measurable in there? You, we, we have to have some measurable goals that we can be checking on a month to month basis. Are we making some progress? Um, and I've written about this and this has resonated with a lot of people. I put plunked four down. How about reading, especially in K through five? Obviously, I don't need to, to, to explain why that one is such a big one for kids. A lot of kids missed reading. It's foundational to their future. If we don't get it right as districts, we are gonna be flooded with kids that have been moved over to, to special ed programs and that'll financially break the district. So we've really got to jump in and get kids back on track on reading. Um, and, we, and we do, there are ways to measure reading sort of more regularly than waiting for some sort of annual assessment. Um, none of this today is about the annual assessments. We're talking about measurable on a more regular basis. Math, all grades, because it's sequential that if you miss, you know, division or exponents, you literally can't go on to the next class and be successful. And it limits your opportunities later in life. High schoolers, how many are on track to graduate if they're missing some classes and are, are not or, or failed some courses and not on track to graduate, we've got to get in there and fix that now. Um, and student attendance and engagement. We have to reset patterns that many of our systems broke their relationships with kids by having uh, school closed for a year and then doing the soft restart for students. And they, they, they need to get in that habit of being in school on time every day, participating in school, getting a good night's sleep the night before and turning their homework and so on. So let me ask, you all this is a chat question what's one you, you don't have to say all of them but what's one big measurable goal that your district or state if you're in a state agency has for students um it can you can just pull one of these off the list or you can say well here's one we were talking about a lot um and i'll i'll, I'll i imagine some of you are thinking about social and emotional learning and that's fine but i as you do that, think about what it is you're measuring regularly alongside that goal. So uh, reading is a popular one right, away, right off the bat. Um, that, makes, that makes me happy because I, I do think it's a, it's a big one. So student engagement, that's excellent. And I hope you're, you're measuring it. So you know, like week to week, how many kids are showing up? Are they participating back in their extracurriculars? Are there extracurriculars? aligned with getting them back into doing homework um, and having students invest. So are we measuring how many kids are doing their homework on a regular basis, basis on that? When I see what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm emphasizing the measurable because a lot of times what we do is we have in our mind a goal, but we're not really measuring. And I can say this, I was talking to a district um, just two weeks ago that said um, that, uh, in student attendance and engagement was one. I said, well, how many students are you worried about? Like how many have been chronically absent? And, and they didn't know, which meant they weren't really measuring this on a regular basis. Um, and so how many schools are able to be in the classroom for in-person learning this past year? So that's backward looking. And I, I get that. I hope we have an immeasurable goal now that, that we're working on right here in april 2023 um so so we'll we'll look at that one we got reading and engagement for a few other ones okay so see see what i've been doing about that i'm, I'm really saying like if we want these investments to reap some benefit for kids we need to know what is our what is our big goal and and we need to measure it and we might First of all, we might get really lousy results at the beginning. Well, that means we got a lot of room for improvement. And then we might try things and they don't work. And then we might have to pivot on those. So the next big strategy on this is financial communication. We, we really need to talk often, speak about the money invested alongside those goals. So if our goal is reading, 
let's talk about our investment in tutors, or if we did a change in curriculum for the teachers, or if we did professional development, or we hired a reading coach, or we offered a summer program, we're checking regularly whether this is working. If we had parent meetings with parents and we asked them, can you also read with your kids at home? Whatever we did, we're talking about these dollars invested and what we're trying to achieve for them. If it's engagement, and we said we hired a counselor because we need kids to come back to school and we upped our, our investment in extracurriculars, well then let's make sure the counselor knows that that $85,000 investment in the counselor is, is to get kids back to school every day doing their homework because the counselor might not know that. So we wanna talk about the money and those goals we want to encourage the principals to engage with their teachers and their parents um, and on these financial choices, talk about them all the time. If we're doing this tutoring, it's because we want these kids to get back up to grade on, on reading. We need the kids to show up. Every time a, a tutor comes, we're spending this much money. So that that is actually part of what yields value is, is getting people's attention focused on this. And then, as you guessed it, the actual measurement, the tracking the progress for students, looking at the metrics as frequently as you can. Luckily, a lot of you said engagement. You can look at that week by week, and I and I would look at it week by week. So sort of celebrate it week by week in terms of attendance, on time, homework, doing their homework. If it's not working, then alter your plans. Um, and, and compare the results and the money we invested by school because schools are really um organic units where they people come together and their behavior work inner inner work works together to get outcomes so if you're working on reading it's not just the first grade teacher or the second grade teacher it's also the librarian it's also the fact that the after school programs are saying to kids did you bring your book did you are you reading at home it's what we do when we engage with our communications with parents and um, and so on. So we really want to make sure all of that is working together to get these goals. Um, so you're thinking, well, that's a tall ask. And what I was going to say is there's an app for that, but there's actually a tool for that. And um, and we we brought this tool and we're going to talk it through with you all. We um, we have a blank version of the tool that you'll have access to, but we went ahead and partially filled it out. So. At Edunomics Lab, we call this the grid. I, I don't know why, because it's just a, a, a grid, I guess. We it needs a better name. Um, and I'm I'm happy if somebody comes up with a better name for it, but it can't be an acronym that you can't pronounce or something like that. So affectionately, we call it the grid where we are. Anyway, it's it's really just A, B, C, D, E, F here, and these categories at the top. And normally it's blank. And what you do is you list different investments you're thinking about down here. Um, and uh, Jack, I don't know what the good Tron reference is, but I, I, I believe you. You can feel free to come off mute and help us out with that. But you put list your investments down here on the left. And then you force yourself to think through, okay, well, what are the major cost factors? How many students is this serving? What's the cost per student? Um, that's, and, and so on. So the cost per student for a second, hold on, is a really important one because this focuses people's attention when they know how much this initiative is costing. And it requires you do something called division. By the way, we love division. We have like a, a, a don't, division is our soulmate here at Edunomics Lab because it gives us cost per student. You take the investment that you're making however many dollars that is, you divide it by the number of kids who are being affected. So if it's a counselor and you think, well, I have um, 72 uh, chronically absent kids and those are the ones I want the counselor to work with, then tell the counselor your, your job is really not to work with the whole school, but is to work with the 72 chronically absent kids. So let's divide the counselor's salary and benefits by those kids. If you want the counselor to work with the whole school, you divide it by the enrollment of the whole school and you're talking about um about that okay so <laughs> tron is a disney movie this is what happens my kids are like grown up now they're um uh my youngest is 18 now so i'm i'm like kind of on the other side of those but i will i will um i will trust 
trust you all and we can make this a disney reference for the grid here um or i'm happy to rename it but that's what we love about division it's really important because we can tell the difference between something that's an $800 investment between for kids and a $200 investment, then we can see if it's working, but it, it's very much focuses the brain on what we're investing in what we're expecting in return. It also asks us to list out our desired outcomes. So if we're investing in tutoring, we have to say, we want this tutoring to get their math and reading scores up or just their reading scores up or whatever it is. And do we think this is going to work? Let's say, is it going to be a high impact, medium, or low? Um, what you're doing is focusing everybody involved, their behavior here on this one. And let's spell out the risks. I mean, maybe the kids aren't going to show up for the tutoring. Maybe the counselor, you know, it's going to be hard to hire a counselor. Maybe the if the kids who are chronically absent, it's going to be hard for the counselor to make contact with them if they're not at school. Okay, you guys are just making fun of me on this Disney movie now. It came out in 1982. I have no excuse. Fine, my kids were not even born in 1982. Um, you win. You're like you. You win. I. I. I give in. I. Um, I don't know why I don't know that movie. Um, anyway, so um, all right, but the risks part is important because we it helps us look ahead to what mistakes we might be making, and it would help us plan now to adjust for those risks. If the kids aren't going to show up for tutoring, do we want to build in some prizes for kids when they come to tutoring? Do we want to send a text message the morning events? Don't forget your kid has tutoring today. What do we do to mitigate those risks if we can see them in advance? And then can we measure and check for that and see if our mitigation is working? So I wanted to, to point out two here. Um, so I, I, we listed two different tutoring options. The first one, as an example, is one-to-one -one tutoring. As you know, that's expensive, right? $3,200 per kid if they're gonna do it three times a week. Um, and yeah, we think that would be probably pre pretty darn effective based on, on all the research on that, but there are some, some risks on it that maybe the kids aren't gonna show up. So there, you contrast that maybe with four-to-one tutoring. So now this is not as concentrated, also, it's not as expensive. It's $800, one fourth of the price, not surprisingly. And you might think, well, it's not as good, but maybe we can reach a whole lot more kids with the, the money we have. We played this out for a million dollars for people. Um, also, maybe if a kid doesn't show up, at least we didn't flush the investment down the drain because they can tutor the other three kids. And that's where some of that risk stuff comes um, handy. So let me ask you all this. One-to-one -one tutoring costs a lot more than four-to-one. Remember, it's $3,000 per kid in our model. Um, and um, if two, but it's probably better, right, than four-to-one. If tutoring is a priority in your district, do you think the higher costs of one-to-one -one are worth it? Or would you say, eh, I think I'm gonna go with four-to-one. Um, and I, I, I'm, you know, you, you, everybody's context is different, and they may make different choices based on that context. But you're making choices now, thinking, what's the cost, uh, what's the effect, and or likely effect, and what are the risks? That's what we want people to do in this thinking. See, see, we've done that. Let's go ahead and put up the results of that poll. All right, kind of, kind of a much more heavily uh with the no i'd lean to four to one um some of you are still uh pretty loyal to the, the third a little more than a third are still saying i I'd, I'd go with one to one um and maybe these are the ones with more cash on hand a lot more money to spend and you can you can use it to reach a lot more students or maybe you're a district with very few students who are behind grade level so you're less worried about that um so you know maybe that's a cost factor there when we do this with district leaders uh people move pretty quickly to the four to one usually more so than the the, the poll here and part of what they're doing is sort of playing off their various variables in their mind in the context of their their own setting so and that's what you should you should do right so in the end if what we are hoping people will do is figure out how much money you have and then consider a bunch of different options and look at this how many students are we going to reach 
Um, what is the cost per student? What do we think we're gonna get from it? And with this tool, you're, you're literally bringing the tool to a meeting to, to make the conversation more concrete. And I, I think everybody in the end, if you pick one of these things, everybody involved in it, all the tutors, or if, it's all, if you've hired counselors, ought to be talking about that investment, the cost factor, the number of students served, the cost per participating student, the desired outcomes and the risks. Um, and um, anyway, I, let's catch me up on the on the chat here, Laura. Sure. So um, Joe is asking, how do we get the grid and a sample? And so we will be publishing the presentation slides and a worksheet, a downloadable worksheet, and I believe also the recording to the Comprehensive um, Center site. And I will get that link for where it will be, and we'll put that into the chat here as well. And um, Janice wants to say hi to Chris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Well, and, um, so the cost, also Wendy's pointing out, could be lower if you're leveraging volunteers or youths. Honestly, tutors thirty dollars an hour is pretty cheap. Most of them are like fifty dollars an hour or higher. But we did see um, Long Beach is paying high schoolers to tutor the younger kids, and they're using Khan Academy as the tutoring platform. So the kids, the older kids, all they are is sitting there making sure the, the younger kids are going through their questions on the Khan Academy. Um, so they they are doing that, and they're keeping that money in the in the in the system in a way like they're using it to pay the the high schoolers i thought that was quite clever on that one um and uh yeah so we'll and we'll we'll um we'll email out or um attach that blank grid katie maybe you, you can do that i can't remember if it's online i know jordan has it so if you can get that in the chat that'd be great um okay so but what we're doing i think it is a few steps that we we don't do and we, we think people can bring this grid to a meeting um, at almost any level in the system and enforce a conversation that helps people connect investments to student outcomes and also helps build principal's capacity to talk about the money in a regular basis. So um, I, I think what we're this what's new here is that we're recognizing the risk, we're finding ways to mitigate them or ensure early detection. So we're, we're thinking ahead on some of these. And um, we're actually saying out loud the desired outcomes because saying the desired outcomes out loud changes people's behavior. It's it, We all think it's like, no, you buy the thing and then you get the outcomes. No, you buy the thing, you talk about what you expect from it, then people change their behavior and then you get the outcomes. And then, um, and, and really we're weighing even before we're purchasing things, um, whether something is worth it, whether it will be high value and whether we'll really get the return um, for it. So let me do a few more polls on this. The first one is the district is going to pay tutors $60 an hour, right? Because the prevailing rate is, you know, um, different in different places. The principal is now out loud reminding tutors and parents of the cost of uh, per hour of tutoring. Do you think they should say that, hey, you guys, I need you guys to start on time and focus. This tutoring is $60 an hour. You can't be late. Or I see you guys are in there like chatting it up. We need, really need for this $60 an hour to, to get a return for math results. Do you think we should do that? And the second one, which looks like, I guess it popped up at the same time, and you can answer both of these, is then the district is gonna pay a counselor $85 in salary and benefits do you think a district leader should re regularly remind the counselor that that $85,000 investment is there to get students back in school and engaged in learning? Do you think we should connect the humans with the money? Um, so I, I will say as you're voting, I'll admit some districts, most districts don't do this. Some district leaders get a little queasy talking about the money and the people. It's almost saying out loud what we're paying for people. And that does make people nervous to do it. Somebody said, it feels like I'm shaming them. And I, I guess I would say in response, I'm not sure it's shaming is so much as we're, we're really signaling in a way what, what matters here. Um, and, it, and you can use a round number, right? That's $85,000 salary plus benefits or something like that. That what we're doing is saying, 
this is a really serious dollar investment and let's make sure it adds value to people. So let's see how people voted on these. Um, kind of mixed. A lot of you were a little bit less comfortable with that as I sort of predicted on this. So I, I'm gonna nudge you a little bit on this because we have done focus groups with um, teachers and specialists who don't connect their role or their salary with kids at all. Um, so you, you, this is not unusual. We, a district pays for a counselor, the counselor shows up at the school, ask where their office is and sits down and does things they, you know, they schedule appointments if kids want to do an appointment. If a parent calls, they'll do a, a call. And if you say, is your, is your salary part of what we spend on kids? They're not connecting it. Um, they're not connecting that salary with outcomes. So I guess I would, I would nudge you to say this, the $60 for an hour on tutoring wakes people up and makes them feel like, oh my gosh, this is a serious investment. I'm now remembering what we're trying to get from it. Um, and similarly, um, like if you say, if you walk by tutoring every time and you see there's no kids there, you can call families and say, we're spending $60 an hour on this tutoring. I really need you to be on time and show up for the tutoring. And if the tutors are late, or you know, kind of like laughing along at a TikTok or something, we can say, you guys, I really, this is a massive investment we're making in math. And we want these kids to get back up and track in math. And same with the, the salary. You might say, you know, on average, our our salaries are in the neighborhood of eighty-five thousand dollars. That's um, with benefits. That's that's a public investment that we're trying to do to get kids back on track. And so um, you're mentioning that money alongside of this. So. I saw some uh, some reactions going by here. Definitely, there is some concern about using a specific dollar amount, and I think it, you can do this without always tying it to an individual. You can use averages, but I think that the key that we've found in the research is that using the dollar amount elicits the emotional response to engage. Yeah, and I think you 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 can say in our district, you know, on average, specialists. A specialist, a full you know investment in a specialist is um, is is in the neighborhood of sixty to eighty thousand dollars. So we we've got to make sure we're getting a return for kids. You don't have to sort of announce down the hallway with a bullhorn that the person in room one hundred six gets paid this and the person in one hundred seven gets paid that. So and I'm I'm not trying to do a shaming. We're trying to do a come to the table, roll up your sleeves, and help us solve this problem kind of way um and, and Anne also has a sorry Anne also has a note in here is providing clear focus is helpful but also aligning their daily work to that focus right and that, i think that's part of what we're trying to do i i asked you if, if leaving the, the money made sense in there um wendy was saying that we separate services from costs in hospital and doctors yeah the whole world complains about that right they want to know if these procedures cost so that people can find out if the investment in something was even worth that. So I know we do that, but we're saying we got to pull that back in if we are hoping that our ESSER investments are going to realize some sort of value for kids um, on that. So I know I'm pushing kind of hard on that one. So um, let's, let's, let's uh, try a little bit on this. Let's get started on the measurable goal. Imagine if your measurable goal is reading. A lot of you mentioned that. You might, for reading, have a bunch of things in the left-hand column, like a new reading curriculum, professional development, maybe a, a literacy program, um, so on and so on. Reading logs, where the you know the K through three kids are are doing reading logs, and we want the parents working hard at nights and the weekends to get the kids reading. Um, maybe some pre-K parents read with kids program. Your investment in the library librarian and so you're 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 listing all these investments <clears throat> and then you're you're clarifying how much they cost um how many kids are affected what outcomes do we think we're going to get and what risks they are and then you're trying to measure over time whether the reading is coming so that's what we're we're sort of looking at this um so the the idea here with the grid is that district teams can work together to fill it in. 
for any proposed or considered investments or even recent investments. And then you're asking yourselves, which ones make more or less sense from a cost and value perspective? And then we're doing that next step. And this step I think people miss. We're sharing the grid with those who are implementing the programs. And we're asking them, what ideas do you have on how to minimize risks? Um, we're not going six months and realizing that the program was a waste and no one showed up for it, or the people we were trying to serve never came to school, or that the position went unfilled for weeks on end or whatever. And we're revisiting the grid, the grid regularly to update with data um, and on the implementation. So we're saying how many kids showed up for tutoring, how many of the sessions were um, uh, unattended, and, and then we're checking whether any changes are needing, needed. So we're looking at some sort of reading progress on a regular basis, and are the kids that are going to tutoring, A, are they showing up, and B, are we seeing some progress with their reading? So I'll stop there on that before I have a, a, a few more ways to kind of build this thought into a few other practices at districts, but I thought I would check with you um, any reactions right now and are any of you doing something like this and how is it going? And I, I would say, you know, we're asking a lot of districts right now. I mean, the, the workload for district leaders has been unbelievable in the last 18 months. It's it's ridiculous, right? All this money came, a lot of forms had to be filled out, strategy decisions, then the world changed, there was Omicron and some parents didn't wanna come back to school, some staff didn't wanna work, there were fights over masks and all this other kind of stuff while we're trying to deploy programs. I, I get, it's been a lot. So I'm not, in any way sort of saying, hey, you guys didn't do your job, you weren't working on something like this. We're just trying to help make some tools available to kind of sharpen and, and pivot investments, given that we're a year in, so that we can really maximize the investments value for kids in the next two years. So let, let me jump forward and you feel free to, to put some stuff in chat too as we go and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, we're, we also thought we wanna use this approach, this kind of mindset to get the most from contracts. And I, I'm actually not talking about labor contracts, we'll talk about those in a second. I'm talking about procurement contracts here. So um, what we wanna do in a contract, uh, first of all, and we say, because there's a lot of contracting going on right now. So when we have, this wave of new money um, and it's short-term money, many districts can and should be applying some of that money via procurement contracts, right? It's a way to, to dial up your capacity and then be able to dial it back out down when the money runs out. So include an out clause because some contracts are already seeing this around the country um, end up failing. They're not very good. Something happens. They were done in a hurry. Um, and now the district can't get out of them. So make sure you have an out clause in there. Put the per student costs in there. This is again, it's both focusing what we're um, what the costs are for the for the, um, the the contractor, so they can sort of feel this urgency. Put performance targets in there. So what are we expecting for this? And a requirement, and I love this one, that the contractor do the work of assembling some data on performance. So if a contractor is the tutoring provider, I want to know how many what, what how many uh, meetings every month went without a kid there or maybe every week I want to report on that. And I want if you're doing some uh, if you're using Khan Academy or some sort of reading software with the kids, I want some sort of measurement that the kids are making progress. And I want to be able to know early on if it's not working. Um, the contractors if the district is you know, buried in things. So asking the contractor to do that also wakes up the contractor um, to what it is you're really caring about. And um, also what the contractor will do to mitigate any risks. So whatever it is, if we're worried that the contractor won't have, uh, kids will miss, miss appointments or something like that, then um, I wanna hear what the contractor can do for those. So um, uh, I we, 
we were we often use this contract that a district did for jumpy houses as an example and um the point of the jumpy houses i think i'm not totally sure about this was to get parents to bring their kids back to the kind of back to school day in the um in the before the school started trying to create a warm feeling and having kids jump in the bouncy houses we could ask the contractor that well i want to know our goal is that a lot of people come and so we're going to pay you this much and we also will pay you maybe even extra if more people come and i want you to track how many people came and, and jumped on the bouncy houses and and then the contractor might be like well then i'm going to bring my biggest tallest bouncy houses and i'm going to put them right by the perimeter of the property so people driving by can see them and i'm going to be really welcoming and encouraging the families come and i'm i'm going to spread the word that hey we're going to have our bouncy house at this property you know come so you you're basically getting the contractor who might be agnostic whether something works to suddenly be on your side and working for that so so maybe i'll i'll um well i will have a question for you in a moment but i want to point out on the district or the SEA side, if you're writing a contractor, you can do some of these things too. Identify what the district or the state agency can do to mitigate risks, right? We might we want to think about that up front. This takes some time. Um, you also want to bring the contract to the board alongside the desired outcomes. So in a public meeting, we're saying this investment is to get these outcomes. Also discuss the costs and the risks post the contract online that that allows for a lot of transparency uh also is it can protect the district if you miss something right you're like we weren't hiding anything we posted all online and then i like this last one because i'm not sure districts have the capacity but get a task force of some sort it can even be volunteers in your community to regularly review the progress of the contractor so whether that's on a um monthly or quarterly basis the contractor is coming in with their data and their progress which makes the contractor just behave more on the up and up on these kinds of things so let me ask you this one um do you think a contract let's say for an after school provider should be expected to include some targets for students in school academic performance can we say Hey, you know, I know you're an aftercare provider, you do basketball um, after school programs, but we want you, your program, to help increase attendance at school and homework, uh, completion of homework. Do you think we can ask the after school provider that they have an effect on that? Uh, Kathy's on my side on this one. Absolutely. Okay. So somebody I know did that. So it was, we, I live in Seattle, you know, a couple years ago, the city funded the after school programs and required the after school provider to demonstrate that they were in, as an after school provider, it was like the boys and girls club and stuff like that. And the YMCA that they, their pro the kids in their program were seeing improved performance at school attendance, grades, and you name it. And at first, the aftercare providers are like, what are you talking about? We we do basketball with the kids, or we're a music program, or our kids like come here and run around. Like, how are we supposed to have any effect on what happens in the school day? We don't have the same employees. We're 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 not even on the same property. And the and the city um, said, I don't know. I would like you to figure that out. And they did. Um, the basketball program suddenly called the school and said, Well, these are the kids in our program. Can you send us a note? if the, the kid is not at school and um and they started spending the first half an hour or 20 minutes of their after care program talking to the kids like you know did you get your homework done let's do homework now how did that test go and it worked that the kids who were participating in the after care programs saw dramatic improvement in their schooling programs they maybe have a different relationship with them whatever it was it was um, uh, phenomenally effective but aftercare program it hadn't occurred to them that that was their job at all so they they had to kind of list it out and say i know you're going to have to figure it out i don't know how you're going to do it but do it um so anyway that's that's one of the things we look for okay so we've got another one a thing we call the budget dance so in most districts the budget dance happens like this. 
the finance team um, assembles a budget, a projected budget from the prior year. It includes some requests, and then it breaks out the figures by object of function and, and puts them all in some spreadsheets. Then they bring them to a budget working session, uh, budget working session number one, where the team, a couple board members, some, some um, senior leadership in the district come together and they compare revenue projections to the first draft of the budget. They're all looking at some spreadsheets. And they take note of the fact that, yeah, there's a gap. We'd, we can't do everything we'd hope to do. Um, and they tell the staff, you're gonna have to trim this. So now the finance team goes back into um, their offices and they trim some of the requests. They call uh, some of the schools and go, we're not gonna have enough money for that. Or they tell um, HR that you're just not gonna be able to do this, that, or whatever. And they, um, they get some savings, maybe from some open positions. Maybe they tap some of reserves. And now the draft budget is balanced. So they bring it to a working session number two and they go, we're balanced now bummer that we're going to, you know, couldn't do this or that, but they agreed to advance the budget now to the board. And now the budget goes to the board and um, the board approves the budget with minimal discussion. And that's what we call the budget dance that happens in many districts. Um, what's your thinking about that? Um, seems reasonable or does something make you feel a little less comfortable about that? Um, it's, it's, it is what we see in lots of places. Um, are you happy with it? I guess, as I'm saying. Uh, Brenda's pointing out actually, it's a kind of nice, um, add on that instead of contractor using the word partner. And, um, I think that's, that's kind of a nice, um, a, a touch on that it sort of puts us on the same side of the on the table. I'm, I'm just trying to be clear about what the relationship is. Um, um, okay, great. So let's put the results up on this one of the poll. And 47% of you said seems reasonable. 53% of you said, yeah, I'm kind of less comfortable with that. So I'll, I'll tell you why that model which has been in place for decades in many districts makes me nervous is that we haven't done these things where we look at programs we talk about what our expected return is going to be how much they cost per student what are the risks we don't go back and measure our investments from last year and see if they're worth continuing but that the budget becomes this very financial discussion without much of that information in there even on our contracts we're not saying is it time for us to end this contract it's really not working um it we're not building that into our our budget um uh discussion and michael's saying it doesn't include much community engagement either it really doesn't people in the community are sort of I, i've watched this happen over and over again sometimes they show up at that final board meeting but the board meeting, it's too late, right? The, the budget is sort of an intact document, like a Rubik's cube that's already been solved in a way and people didn't get to do any input on it. Um, and that's that also makes me nervous. It also means we haven't sort of involved a lot of uh, principals sort of thinking on, is this gonna work or not? Should we change what we did last year? We're not creating an urgency around results from kids. You often have a kind of, um, sort of monotone financial discussion in those meetings, and I've sat in lots of them. So your district might be different, but that's what makes us nervous about it. So let me ask you this. Um, what do you think of requiring that the budget working sessions include some sort of look at the grid? Like, should we bring that? It's not a financial document, right? It's really a planning strategic document. Should we say, fine, thank you for bringing all these financial sheets. I also wanna bring our grid, maybe even the one we had last year with our last year's investments. And we wanna talk about that while we're at our budget meeting where we're spending a lot of money. 
Um, so what, what do you think about that? Generally, we, we don't, but we could, and it certainly would liven up a lot of these financial um, meetings, these, uh, these budget workshops, which generally, I'm telling you, if you want to go to a yawner of a meeting, that's often a yawn of a meeting, and it should be. It's the moment we're spending a lot of this money, but we haven't baked into the process some of these other discussions. In fact, it might actually bring some more people in. Let's put up the results of that one. A lot of people said, seems reasonable. So there's an opportunity there to do that and to kind of think about those things and, and see if that works. So that's one strategy we, we offer up. Um, because of uh we're 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 sort of in in budget season on this stuff and we still we're at a year where we're really thinking about a pivot on our esser fundings we thought um it wouldn't work if we didn't talk about this so hello inflation you're back it's been quite a number of years we did not miss you um but inflation is back and that is a, a game changer for many districts it's throwing a wrench in a lots of plans. I tweeted this out. Um, sure, the costs for buses and gas and food are all up. Construction and facilities are changing. The costs of those are changing by the minute. Some districts we think are going to see a bump in their health benefits bill, but the biggie of all biggie is labor costs, right? With more than 80% of district dollars going to labor, the bigger effect is gonna come as the um, collective bargaining contracts end and the salary negotiations start. So employees are gonna want bigger raises, right? They are all wanting bigger raises. I want a bigger raise. Everybody wants a bigger raise, right? Gas just went up and um, travel costs, oh my gosh. And you name it, things are, are, are climbing right now as we know that. So um, what we do with labor costs is gonna really, change the way we think about both our remaining ESSER money, but also our regular bu our budget. So let me put this poll up. So I think 7.9% was the last inflation number we got. I mean, wow. And by the way, in, our, in my neighborhood, the lowest cost gas is over $5 a gallon. So what's your thinking if teachers are asking for a 7% raise? Yes, that's fair. Well, yeah, but I want a longer school year in return. Am I am I asking for something in return? Um, or I'd agree to a 4% since most teachers are going to get a 3% out of their step and column raises. Or, uh, I mean, there's too many unknowns ahead. And I'm better to go with a one-time $4,200 bonus. That's something, you know, I don't want to bake this in, in permanently for the future. Or would I prefer targeted pay raises to address persistent gaps. So if my problem is really not about kindergarten teachers leaving or PE teachers leaving, then I don't want to do a massive raise on those. I can't get a science teacher or a special ed teacher, and I've got a lot of openings. I'd rather put the money there. So what is your thinking on that one? Um, curious how, how you vote on this. So take a second, make sure you get the vote in. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's post it. All over the place. Wow. So reasonable people, thoughtful people can 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 take different approaches on this. And actually, it turns out that's what we're seeing in the field. That um, some are saying, "Fine, I'm going to bake in a big raise, even if gas prices and some of these things come back down. I'm going to obligate myself to that for the future." Which does worry me. Um, some of you are thinking right now, well, I want something in return, whether, you know, I, I have kids that I need to get back on track and I, um, and I need to, to be accountable to my students for that. And I, I, I love that idea of asking for something in return. Some of you are saying, well, I, I might as well take stock of my 3% step and column. I'm only going to build in a modest raise right now. So one thing we found in our focus groups is that teachers prefer their raise in dollars than percents the percents sound like tiny even a six percent raise which would be massive eh, they don't ever do the math they don't know how much money they got but if you say i'm giving you a four thousand two hundred dollar bonus and everybody's getting that people are like 
Woohoo, that's a lot more money, even if it's the same amount of money as the percent raise. So my, I would encourage you to think in terms of dollars. It does mean you're directing the same amount of money to junior teachers than as you are senior teachers. By the way, here's another tidbit. Senior teachers don't leave. They don't. They're walking away from too much pension. And I would really encourage you to look at your numbers. The turnover we're seeing right now is among junior teachers. Also, it's not substantially higher nationally than it in normal years. It's it's higher in some fields. Um, also, we're seeing a lot of turnover in hourly workers like um, paraprofessionals and bus drivers and food service workers. So, um, so don't get lured by a national narrative on that. You really want to look at your own data. Um, but I would say this is a great time to consider the the dollar pay increase, which a few of you liked. And some of you said, I've got to do targeted right now because I can't have some of these positions open. Um, so some of you are saying, well, I would do a split difference. I know I gave a lot of options. So I was kind of asking people to lean one way or the other. Um, and it, interesting that we have a number five where it's hard to fill, but not rewarding those who stay and persist. Go, oh, that's a lead in for my my next one which is um there is right now more than anything like we've seen in the last three dec decades a lot of districts using innovative pay we're seeing flat dollar raises like i just mentioned um that would eat more evenly distribute funds among junior and senior teachers we're seeing a lot of non-recurring stipends or bonuses maybe because the world feels very unstable right now. And we have this opportunity to kind of think in terms of something that is this year only. We have a lot of non-recurring funds, so we can talk about that in a way that is more financially sustainable for our districts. Um, targeted pay to fill shortage areas, so specific labor needs. Um, and, then, and then I'm not sure if this is what you meant, Wendy, but private sector type of strategies like moving costs or signing bonuses or if you stay for your first or second year we'll give you a retention bonus we're not necessarily rewarding those who stay and persist because they're already disproportionately rewarded in the in the um, uh, salary schedule and they are not leaving really they're not leaving um because they're disproportionately war rewarded in the in the um, pension scheme too so if we're if, you know, if you're a, a teacher that's been around for 18 years, you're really walking away from a lot of money to, um, and you won't see that same pay out in, in other fields. Um, so we're trying to do this kind of retention bonuses for junior teachers, but also pay pride to provide tied to other priorities like extra work. Like if you take on extra tutoring or um, a longer year, or if you want to come and participate in the summer programs, or we'll even take on a larger, if you're a good teacher and we'll take on a larger class size, then we can see um, stipends for that. And principals tend to want some of their money in stipends. They wanna be able to look at those teachers who stick around longer and help them um, out when the when the buses are late. And, um, and you know some of their teachers walk out the door right away and they've got kindergartners running all over the property and they want stipends for those teachers who will go that extra mile who they really do want to retain or pay tied to non-traditional things, such as if we get enrollment to come back, we saw a lot of paying for getting vaccinated and things like that. So in the chat, what problems are you hoping to solve with any pay activity and, and what will that do for kids? And I think that's a, a framing we wanna we want to use even when we go into to pay for this coming year. Um, Any, any thoughts on that on what on what you're you're trying to address um, on these and and as you're typing that in um i i want to make sure i give time for for jill she's got some some upcoming uh reminders for us all so jill um can you share those yeah hi thanks everybody and thanks marguerite as always this is really thoughtful and thought-provoking and i can tell by the chat that people have been really engaged i wanted to remind everyone or let everyone know that we're going to have the third webinar in this series on september 21st so we're going to wait a little while until to see how spending is playing out over the summer and then we will revisit this series uh, towards the end of September. So mark your calendars for that. 
And then on April 14th, next week, uh, we're going to be having a, a new series kicking off called the National Center Presents. And we'll be talking about um, making summer a sustainable, successful and sustainable strategy to support student growth. So during that webinar, we'll be hearing from national summer researchers and local practitioners around what it looks like to design execute and sustain summer learning and enrichment programming over time and we'll be also sharing ev lessons evidence-based lessons from local districts and so please join us for that i'll be putting a link to the page where you can register for that in the chat um, and then on the next slide there is some contact information for the national center for marguerite and the team and i believe marguerite you might be fielding some questions thanks everybody yeah i just thought i was look look just as a way to kind of wrap it up here some of the comments um, some some are saying retention of effective teachers, and um, so that's interesting because I wonder if you're going to you're going to give everybody a raise and retain some of the ineffective ones too, um, or are you going to target the raise to those who are effective? Generally speaking, we we saw a lot of pushback on that kind of pay for performancey stuff, but um, but maybe your area is different. And then Sarah's saying morale. Morale is one um, that maybe then you want to do a one time raise instead of kind of lock that in for the future. And maybe you want to do that and raise in dollars because a teacher will hear a 5% raise and go, eh. but if they hear the dollars for some reason, maybe percents are not their thing. They never really learned how to calculate them, but they like the dollars better. It probably does more for morale. And I would say morale is something that could change. So you want to maybe do that one time in a way. Um, and um and then uh pay strategies oh, we have educator retention if it's retention you really want to make sure we know who it is that's leaving um because we might be spending a lot of money on retaining pe teachers and theater teachers and they're not leaving generally they they tend not to or librarians or things like that so we want to really kind of focus on that and more learning time i love hearing that um to try to get the kids that need it some more more time on 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 those um and then and one saying except the prior experience of a seasoned teacher moving to your state so you, you might do that as a, a strategy to to retain someone you might also spend a lot of money on somebody who's not necessarily better um so so i would you know check on that experience it turns out is really poorly correlated with effectiveness um and so we want to we really find out that 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 teacher can sort of bring bring that talent for the for the students on those but you, but you may have a way of doing that so any other questions or comments i will open it up for people if they do um and as you know the um the link there jill put in is is there to register for the other one and um and we will um would love to hear your your feedback on the grid um, we'd love to hear how you're using it and how it goes. And if you have any questions or comments, you're always welcome to reach out to us. Um, there's also a, a link to our newsletter and we will have some of those, but you can always also reach out to the um, National Center, which is a, a nonstop source of some excellent resources. Well, thank you all. Happy April. Should be really busy month with uh, finance decisions in school districts. Uh, a race to the finish. So thank you everybody. Um, this was uh, this was fun with you all. <laughs>